The topic for today's lecture is modern governments and economies. We're going to take a look through kind of four main topics, the evolution of government uh, and kind of how government grew into the types of governments we see today. And then we'll take a look at six types of government that exist in the world today, uh, a couple of systems of government that look at the way power is distributed within a, within a government, and then we'll look at a couple different types of economies that exist. So starting off with the evolution of government, and as you're filling in your lecture outline, you know, you should be able to kind of keep up and, and keep track of where everything goes within that outline. So man has pretty much always needed government in some form, even in prehistoric times, you know, when uh, humans lived in very small family-based clans, there were often leaders who, you know, made decisions for those small clans as they were, you know, hunting or, you know, trying to survive. So a lot of times that might be, you know, the strongest person uh, or maybe the oldest person um, but there was some sort of leader who was in charge of making those decisions. As you moved away from that sort of hunting lifestyle where humans lived in these small nomadic clans, uh, you, you get to a period where farming allows people to stay put. So my beautiful drawing here, you know, up at the top, you see how city-states start to develop and then pro progress to empires. So it starts with, you know, people being able to say, hey, I don't have to chase animals anymore. We can farm now. We can grow wheat. We can grow crops. We can, you know, grow trees where we can get apples and oranges and other fruit. And so uh, they didn't have to chase animals around and could, in could instead put down roots, right? Build houses and stay in one place. And as more and more people start to live in the same place, um, you get the first cities, you know, and these really start in what's now, you know, we, we refer to now as the Middle East. Um, but, you know, cities pop up in, in, in other parts of the world as settlements begin to develop, usually along a river. But when you get lots of people living close together, um, problems arise. And so these, these early cities had to create governments as a way to make rules for things like how to settle disputes, how to make sure that everyone has access to water for their crops, right? To create fair rules to live by. And so in these city-states, you know, again, you might have, uh, you know, the, the strongest, whoever would be seen as maybe the strongest or who could provide the most protection might make those rules. Um, different cities might have had different systems for, for deciding who uh, would have the power to make rules for that city. Gradually, as time goes on, strong cities, um, sometimes through alliances, but oftentimes through conquering, began to take over and, and uh, bind together with other city states in the area, and they start to grow into the world's first empires. So, you know, you had uh, an ancient Roman Empire, there, were, there was an uh, uh, empire in ancient China, right? Just very large collections of city-states who were unified under one ruler who would be the emperor, right? And that person's power might be hereditary. It might have been passed from father to son, like often did in the Roman Empire. Um, they might have claimed power through God and claimed that, that God chose them to be uh, the emperor, but uh, you had these, these empires that uh, start to, to take root, okay? And again, the emperor uh, would, would be in charge of coming up with the rules for the empire and, and for keeping the empire safe against invaders and other threats. An important shift in the development of human government happens about 2,500 or roughly 2,500 years ago with ancient Greece and ancient Rome and, and the development of democracy, the idea that the people should be the source of power, not 
some ruler who just happens to be the strongest, not some ruler who claims to be put there by God, but rather the people are the source of power. And in ancient Greece, they were small enough that they come up with the concept of direct democracy. And again, in my beautiful drawing, you can sort of see a very simple illustration of that, where all of the eligible citizens are able to weigh in on rules, laws, important decisions. And so eligible citizens primarily, you know, meant males, right? Males who had uh, the, um, <clears throat> the authority to participate. So, you know, foreigners, women, those who were enslaved, they would not be allowed to participate, okay? But for the first time, the people of a city, the people of an area got to directly decide what rules they would live under, not have to necessarily follow the rules of some emperor. Rome was a little bit too big for direct democracy, but they also had democracy. They developed what was called representative democracy. And so you can see the difference between the two here, where instead of direct, where every eligible male got a say, down on the bottom, Rome was too big for that. So different parts of Rome, the eligible males would elect a representative. And that representative would speak for them. And that representative would serve, say, in the Roman Senate and would get to have a say uh, on behalf of all the people he represented. Okay? And so, you know, those ideas are very important to us in America today. We are a representative democracy, right? We borrowed those ideas from Greece and Rome. Now, Greece and Rome hang around, especially Rome, for a good long while, um, but eventually they fall, right? And, and we enter kind of the Dark Ages into the Middle Ages, um, where in some ways government kind of takes a step back. And that brings us into this Middle Ages idea, um, which a lot of you who are here for ninth grade are familiar with, with the concept of feudalism, right? In the absence of powerful, strong governments like the Roman government, um, people kind of went back to uh, lo local groups, right? Uh, and so the strongest people in an area would be able to gather up the land and then the people who lived there would sort of pledge their loyalty and provide their labor on behalf of that noble who ruled over the land. And so on the top there you see, right, the, you know, the, the person, the stick figure with fancy stick figure dress, right, saying, you know, I, I can protect you, um, but, you know, you have to work my land. And so those, those serfs, those peasants, you know, uh, would work the land in exchange for protection, um, and, and you have that system of feudalism. Feudalism sort of eventually goes by the wayside. Power, again, becomes consolidated in um, smaller groups of people where the, the strongest people in an area would take charge, right? And, and these different knights would, would pledge loyalty to the strongest ruler among them who eventually would become a king, a monarch, right? And you enter this age of absolute monarchies in, you know, the 1500s into the 1800s, you know, places like England and France and Spain were absolute monarchies where all of the power rested with the king, okay? Sometimes the queen, uh, but often it was, you know, a, a king who was the strongest of all uh, the, and had all the power, right? Made total decisions. You know, Louis XIV is a great example where he famously said, I am the state, right? Like, I'm the nation, the nation is me, uh, I have total power. Some of these absolute monarchs did a pretty good job and were loved by their subjects, others not so much. And that brings us to an age of revolutions. Uh, and so you can see the, the absolute monarch sitting on the throne going, oh, this is, this is not good, right? The, the people are rebelling against me, they're coming for me. And so oftentimes <clears throat> uh, these absolute monarchies either were overthrown um, or they morphed into something different. And so a lot of times, you know, you see these, these revolutions of the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s fall into either they succeed and you have the development of a modern democracy uh, or they, they sometimes fail and they're brutally 
put down and you see the development of dictatorships, uh, some of which still exist in the world today where you know that, that one ruler has crushed all dissent and still maintains uh, absolute power. So as we move into types of modern governments, right? We're going to look at six different types of governments that exist in the world today. The first two are governments where all the power rests in one person. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through a simple description, you know, one or two advantages, one or two disadvantages of each type of government. The first is a monarchy, right? And so, you know, you've got Queen Elizabeth, Queen of England. Um, <clears throat> she's an example of a monarch. The definition of a monarchy is a government where power is held by a single hereditary ruler. All the power rests with one ruler. The powers pass from, you know, down the bloodline, father to son, sometimes maybe father to daughter. Um, but power is held by a single hereditary ruler. An advantage of a monarchy is that it's very efficient. There's one person making the decisions. And so it's, you're able to quickly get things done. You also know who's going to be the next ruler, right? There's no question about who the next king of England will be. Everyone already knows, right? So transition from one ruler to the next can be pretty smooth. However, disadvantage, you know, if you're, if the ruler happens to be a bad ruler, you're oftentimes just stuck with him or her, right? I mean, yes, you could rebel and rise up, but you know, that that's violent and people don't always want to do that, right? So it's kind of hard to get rid of a bad ruler in a monarchy. <clears throat> Another type of government where power is held by one person is a dictatorship. And the description of a dictatorship would be a government where power is held by a single ruler who takes over and rules through force. Right? Power is held by a single ruler who rules through force. And so, you know, a good historical example of that would be Adolf Hitler. Okay. Um, an advantage of a dictatorship, like with a monarchy, it's efficient. You can get things done quickly because you still only have one person making those decisions. Dictatorships can also, kind of almost ironically, bring peace to a country um, but only because people can't speak out. People can't argue uh, because they're, they are shut down if they do. Obviously, it disadvantages of dictatorship, you know, they're, they're violent uh, and dictators are often very cruel and use their power unfairly. The next two types of government are government where power is held by a small group, small group of people. So the first is a single party state. And a single party state is a government where there is only one political party. And the rulers of that party make all the decisions. Right? There's only one political party and the rulers of that party, usually a very small group, make all the decisions. So a good historical example would be uh, the Communist Soviet Union. Even today, um, Communist China is a single party state, right? Uh, North Korea is a, well, a dictatorship, um, but in terms of uh, it's the functioning of its government. It's also a single party state. An advantage, since there's only one political party, there's no political fighting, right? You don't have to work with another party, right? Whatever that party wants to get done, it can get done. So it's efficient and there's no political arguments. But a disadvantage is if you disagree with that political party, you don't have a voice in your government, right? So, you know, in, in communist China, people who disagree with the government, it's not like they can vote for someone else. There's only one political party. Another type of government where a small group hold the power is a theocracy. And this is a government where power is held by the religious leaders. So a great example of that today is here in the picture, Vatican City. Vatican City is a theocracy. Power is held by the religious leaders. An advantage of this would be that there's often social unity, right? The laws that you pass are going to be in line with your religious values. The laws you pass will be in line with your religious values. Um, but a disadvantage is that 
minorities can be persecuted. They can be picked on, right? They sometimes are thrown in jail, sometimes even killed um, because they are not part of that majority religion. The next two types of government are both democracies, right? And this is where power is held by many. So we had two governments where power is held by one person, two governments where power is held by a small group, and then we have the democracies where power is held by the people, by many. The first is a presidential democracy, which we are most familiar with because that's what we have here in America. In a presidential democracy, the people, the voters, choose lawmakers, which you see there is the legislative branch. The voters choose lawmakers, and the voters also choose the leader, the president. Voters get to pick their lawmakers. They also get to pick their president. An advantage of that is that there is a separation between the legislative branch and the executive branch. There's The power is separated between those two groups. And so they can help keep each other in line. They can check each other and keep them balanced so neither group gets too much power. A disadvantage is that that can sometimes cause gridlock. If the legislative branch is from one party and the president's from a different party, they might disagree, right? We see that uh, a lot where, you know, if Congress is controlled by Republicans, but the president is a Democrat, they might disagree and it can cause gridlock and not much gets done. The next type of democracy is a parliamentary democracy. And we would probably most commonly think of parliament in England, right? England has a parliamentary democracy. And so the difference here is that voters still get to vote and voters choose their lawmakers, but then the lawmakers pick the leader. In a parliamentary democracy, voters pick the lawmakers, the lawmakers pick the leader. So in England, you know, if the conservative party has control of parliament, then those lawmakers are going to pick someone from the conservative party to serve as the prime minister. Okay. An advantage of that is that it's easier to get laws passed. Your leader will always be from the political party in the majority. So it's, it's easier to get laws passed. A disadvantage is you don't have that separation of power anymore. Right? Because the lawmakers pick the leader, the leader is more responsible to the lawmakers. He, he, he's not in a separate or she is not in a separate branch of government. Um, so you don't have a clear separation of power. So it's harder for them to, to block each other and keep each other from getting too powerful. The next topic we're going to talk about is systems of government. And, and with this, what we're really looking at is how is power split up? Does it go to the national level or does it go to the regional level? Does it go to the national level or does it go to the regional level? So the first is a unitary system. And in a unitary system, all of the power is given to the national government. Right? Uni means one. There's only one national government in any country. And so uni means one. There's only one national government. The one national government, or in the picture it says central, same thing, has all the power. And then it can grant some power to the regional governments or what we would call state governments. Right. Uh, an example of this would be like when we were under England. England gave all of, it, all of the power to the central government, parliament, and then parliament allowed us colonies to do some things, but only what it allowed us to do, right? 
And so we didn't like that. We didn't like the idea of the, the national government having all the power. So when we became our own country, we actually said we're, we're not going to do a unitary system. We're going to try a confederal system where all of the power is given to the regional or state governments, and then they decide what powers the national government can have. So it's almost the opposite. What it is, the opposite of a unitary system. All the power is given to the states, and then the states decide to give some power to the national government. And then we have a federal system. So I'll go back and talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages, but I just want to make sure we kind of understand the difference here. In a federal system, power is split. It's shared between the national government and the state governments, right? The national government gets some powers and the state governments get some powers. Um, so it, it's split, it's shared. So if we go back to a unitary government where all the power is given to the national government, an advantage of that is that the entire country follows the same set of laws, right? Everybody has the same laws. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Everyone knows what the, the same laws apply to everybody. But a disadvantage of that is that laws that work really well in one part of a country might not work as well in another part. Right? Particularly for a large country like the United States, right? A law that would be really good for somebody in Alaska might not be that great for somebody in Florida, right? And so that's a disadvantage of a unitary government. Under this confederal government where all the power goes to the states, an advantage is that that gives the states power to create their own laws. They can create the laws that work best for them. But a disadvantage is you could have a lot of very different laws inside of the same country, right? If every state can make up its own laws, it can get kind of confusing, right? Imagine if here in the United States, you know, if we went from Virginia and drove to North Carolina and the laws were entirely different and then you kept going and you got to South Carolina and the laws there were completely different again, you know, it could, it could be kind of confusing. Another big problem with a confederal system is that uh, frequently the national government is too weak, right? The national government's too weak to deal with a crisis. And this, that's the problem that we ran into, right? We set up, we gave all 13 states a lot of power and we had a very weak national government and, and there was just too much fighting. The national government couldn't solve any problems. And so it just didn't work for us. And so the federal system is kind of in the middle. And on your chart there in your, in your notes, it's in the middle. And it's in the middle for a reason, right? Because it's between the two. So an advantage of that is that it keeps a stronger national government, but it still allows states to come up with some of their own rules. So you do have a powerful national government, but you're giving some power to the states too to come up with their own rules. So it's a nice middle ground. A disadvantage of doing that is that sometimes there can be conflicts between the state governments and the national government. Right? They can kind of fight with each other. So if you give some power to the national government and some power to the states and they disagree with each other, then sometimes there can be fights between state governments and the national government. They can disagree with one another. All right, almost done. Last topic we're going to talk about are some modern economies. Okay. And there, there are three main types of economies. There's a fourth one that's on here um, that, that I'll mention. But the three main types of economies we're going to find in the world today. Uh, 
traditional economy. In a traditional economy, economic decisions are made by tradition. They're made by custom. They're kind of made by uh, what's always been done. So by economic decisions, I'm talking about things like um, what jobs will people have? How much are you going to make of certain products? How much will things cost? How will people get the goods? Right. How are you going to print money? How are you going to, you know, all of these kinds of decisions uh, related to the economy. In a traditional economy, those questions are answered by custom, by tradition. So, you know, uh, you grow up and you're going to be a farmer because your father was a farmer and he taught you how to be a farmer. And guess what? His father was a farmer too. And so was his father. Right. A good thing, an advantage of a traditional economy, is that it, it often runs very smoothly, right? Uh, everyone kind of knows what job they're going to have. Everyone works together to, to get the things that they need, right? The farmer will bring his crops to the market and maybe trade it for a cow, right? The, the weaver will trade some, some cloth for, you know, maybe some meat, right? It runs pretty smoothly. Everyone sort of knows their job. They know what to do. That's an advantage. But a disadvantage is traditional economies tend to be very poor, right? Families are pretty much only having their basic needs met. So traditional economies tend to be pretty poor. A second type of economy is a command economy. A command economy is an economy where the government makes all of the economic decisions. In a command economy, the government makes all the economic decisions. The government decides what jobs are going to be available, who's going to do those jobs, how much people are going to get paid, how much goods are going to get paid, who gets what. The government makes all of those decisions. And so the example here is, you know, a picture of North Korea, right? North Korea is, is an example of a command economy. The government controls it all. An advantage of that is that the government can provide a job for everyone. Right? You can give everyone a job. Command economies also tend to be more stable. They don't really go up and down, up and down, up and down. They tend to stay pretty stable. A disadvantage is that they don't grow very much. Command economies tend to be pretty flat. They're stable, but they're kind of flat. They don't really grow much. Um, and so they tend to not generate tons of wealth. Third major type of economy is a market economy. And most countries in the world have a market economy or, or, you know, mostly a market economy. A good example of, you know, the market economy is right here, Times Square. I mean, all the shops, the restaurants, the hotels, you know, the stores, everything right there for, you know, for, for consumers to buy. And so in a, in a market economy, the economic decisions are made by the people. They're made by consumers through supply and demand, right? The people decide what products they want, and then they go and buy them. And so, you know, if, uh, for example, if consumers decide, hey, we really want, um, you know, uh, more advanced smartphones, then companies are going to make more advanced smartphones because they know people will buy them. It, people decide, hey, we don't want all of these extra things in our smartphones. We want, you know, something else instead then companies are going to adjust accordingly because they want to make money. So the people make economic decisions in a market economy. An advantage is that market economies tend to grow a lot faster. There's a higher standard of living in countries with market economies, right? There's more wealth. The economy grows faster. 
market economies are also really good at producing what people want, right? If people are going to buy something, a company is going to make it. If they stop buying it, the company will stop making it and they'll make something different, right? So they're, they're good at, at producing what people want. Now, disadvantages of market economy is that they can be very unstable, right? They go up, but they also go down, right? They have periods of growth, but then they have periods of recession. So when you think about the stock market ticker going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, it usually goes up over time, but it can go down. You know, think about like the Great Depression. Uh, and, and another disadvantage of a market economy is that there can be huge gaps between the wealthy and the poor. The last part of the notes, there's one more economy on there that you see is mixed economy. And all you really need to put down for that is just a quick little description that mixed is a mix of command and market. Right? A mixed economy is a mix of command and market. Almost every country in the world today has a mixed economy. It's just a question of are they mostly command with a little bit of market, like for example, China, or are they mostly market with a little bit of command, for example, the United States, okay? So, you know, the advantages and disadvantages are kind of combination of market and command, depending on how much of one or the other you are, okay? But most countries are actually a mix. They're somewhere in between of market and command. All right, that's it.